2010. I'm going to start. I, I really appreciate everybody who's come back today after last night's uh, very pleasurable uh, photo conference and case reports. First, I want to start off with some acknowledgments. Um, I want to thank the Lighthouse, Chicago Lighthouse, uh, who's helped with communication about the meeting. And they're also providing a video. We're, we'd like to, we're going to individually ask people for permission to use their material. We will not publish anything, but we would like ultimately to have this on the Light, Chicago Lighthouse uh, website. But I understand that people may be presenting data that's not been published. And so um, I will email each person, and we won't actually put anything up at all until we have approval. Um, and the panel discussions, I guess, is only is a little bit free game, fair game, but I guess everybody should be a little bit forewarned that there's a potential that what they say will actually be reported. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it may help. Uh, then secondly, um, I'd like to thank the Clarity Medical System, uh, who are, who's going to who's sponsoring the lunch, which we will hopefully enjoy uh, without in, in a few hours after we're hungry. Uh, then, of course, I would like to thank my practice and my associates uh, and partners at Threatna Consultants Limited, uh, who did a tremendous amount of work, um, as well as sponsored a lot, large part of this meeting. In particular, uh, Ginger Adams, Lisa Parisi, and Martin Arago, if you see them, you should thank them if you liked it. I mean, if you didn't, you should blame me, but they really did everything possible, including coming in on Sundays and working in evenings. Uh, my co-director, uh, Raj Azad, unfortunately, um, it, it's sort of a sign of the times, had bureaucratic political travel issues and um, really sends his regrets. And you'll have to... Uh, I really don't think I can go into greater detail. You can ask him specifically when you see him next. Uh, without, uh, we're going to try to keep on schedule, which uh, we're right now a little bit ahead of schedule. We're going to try to keep on schedule, and we may cheat a little bit by starting early. Um, I'm going to ask the, the speakers to try to limit their, their presentations, because I think really the most important part of this uh, hot topics is the question and answers and the panel discussions. This first session is on telemedicine, which is a very important topic worldwide. Clearly there are um, limitations to the examinations, a number of limitations to examinations, which may be in some ways overcome by telemedicine and is being used and needs to be evaluated and thought about. Today we're going to think about that with uh, the able help of uh, two Michaels, uh, which was not a requirement, by the way, uh, Michael Chang and Michael Tracy, who will lead us in <coughs> telemedicine. We'll have two sessions, first theory and the second part practice. And um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Michael Chang. Um, my name is Michael Chen. I work at Columbia University in New York City, and I do both pediatric ophthalmology and biomedical informatics there. Um, Mike, I want to just start by just acknowledging uh, Dr. Shapiro for putting together this conference. Uh, There's a lot of work for him, and uh, yeah, I know that because I got all these emails from him, you know, often from late at night, and behind all those emails was a lot of work. And, uh, you know, Mike is really passionate about ROP, and I think that this meeting sort of came out of that excitement, and I'm really looking forward to it. Mike had asked me to help him organize uh, uh, some talks in telemedicine. We got eight speakers, really good speakers, but Michael Trace is going to help us uh, uh, moderate. And the way this is organized is that we um, have a theory part and a, tele uh, and a practice part, and four theory speakers, four practice speakers. And after each of those sections is going to be a panel discussion, and that the discussion is what um, you know, Dr. Tracy and I will help to, uh, help to moderate. And, um, Uh, what I want to do is just uh, open this up by giving an overview of what the evaluation studies show uh, involving telemedicine for ROP diagnosis. Okay, just by way of um, disclosure, I'm an unpaid member of the Scientific Advisory Board for Clarity Medical Systems, and 
and also receive some grant funding from the NIH. Um, Mike sort of introduced the fact that uh, the way that we do uh, ROP exams now, um, it has a lot of limitations in bedside and direct ophthalmoscopy. It's uh, really time intensive and logistically difficult. A lot of travel time, a lot of coordination. And uh, in many ways, the exam is uh, subjective and qualitative. And what you do is you basically do your endurance ophthalmoscopy, uh, conceptualize what you see, and you draw it on a piece of paper. And I would make the argument that when you go back in one or two weeks and follow this baby, uh, that it's difficult to compare what you see versus what you drew to tell whether the baby's getting better or worse or whether they're getting stable. And um, there are some issues, some issues about that. Uh, there are major problems involving ophthalmology access, and even in major urban centers uh, here in the U.S. Um, studies have shown uh, that uh, more and more uh, pediatric ophthalmologists and retinal specialists are stopping uh, uh, being involved in ROP exams because it takes too much time uh, because it doesn't pay enough or because there's too much medical legal liability uh, involved. And so, uh, so th those are major issues. And uh, uh, telemedicine is one possible approach to address, um, address those problems. Uh, telemedicine within the past 10 years has uh, really become the standard of care in some of these image-based uh, medical domains, uh, things like radiology and pathology. Uh, if you're in an academic medical center, essentially those practices now are done uh, by telemedicine. Um, uh, one of the potential benefits of that is that it may improve the quality, accessibility, and the cost of care that we're able to deliver. And with regard to ROP, uh, one of the things that makes it possible is that there are now wide-angle retinal imaging devices uh, that are commercially available. And uh, this happens to be a RepCam photo of our eyes. And this may be the same picture that, that's up here, but um, yeah, I, I would argue that the richness of information that you can get from that photograph is just a lot more than what you can see in the uh, sketch up here that when you go back and compare the baby uh, week after week, you can really get a sense of whether you're getting better or getting worse. Um, uh, but I think the key questions are that if we can make this picture, uh, is it accurate? Uh, is the quality good enough for diagnosis? Uh, is it cost effective? And ultimately, is that going to be acceptable uh, to patients and to neonatologists? And so that, that's what I want to review in the um, uh, 10 or 15 minutes up on stage. Uh, so the first question is, um, can we get the right diagnosis by looking at an image? And uh, this is, uh, there's been a fair amount of research in this area, and the study designs are all fairly similar, and I'll outline an approach that we took uh, as an example. Uh, uh, the first question is, uh, can you train a nurse, or somebody who, a technician, uh, somebody who actually uh, works at the point of care to take that image from the baby? Uh, once we've got that, uh, can you recruit some babies to study? Now here we've got 67 premature babies, and at Columbia University, this number represented um, the majority of babies who were screened uh, for ROP during the one-year period. And so everybody got a standard ophthalmoscopic exam, everyone got a digital imaging exam that was done by the nurse uh, working independently. And so those two exams were always done on the same day. And uh, we collected data at uh, two sessions, 31 to 33 weeks postmenstrual age, and 35 to 37. And the rationale for the first time point was that that's when the first eye exam gets done, and so we wanted to capture that. And the rationale for the second time point uh, was that uh, by the time you get to that age, the severe disease starts to declare itself, and so we wanted to capture that time point. And we didn't want to go above 37 weeks because babies may have started to get discharged, so we didn't want to lose um, uh, patients. So then designed um, a, a web-based telemedicine system and programmed, them, uh, programmed it up and hosted it um, back at Columbia. And what the system had is that the nurse uploaded uh, some basic clinical was basically birth weight and gestational age and postmenstrual age at the time of photography. And uh, also uh, uploaded a standard set of images. And so these were images that the nurse selected uh, by herself. And uh, there was one posterior pole view, uh, one temporal retinal view, one nasal retinal view for each baby. And up to two additional images from each baby if they were felt by the nurse to contribute to <laughs> value. We then had graders log into the system and uh, review the images. And if, when we look at the accuracy of the findings, uh, this, this would happen. Uh, this is the first um, time point, so 31 to 33 weeks post-menstrual age. And we had, in this particular study, three graders. And they were all pediatric retinal specialists. And uh, uh, three cutoff points. Uh, was there mild or worse disease? Was there type 2 pre-threshold disease? 
uh, or was there treatment requiring disease? And that was as defined by the ET ROP study, in other words, type one or worse uh, ROP. And for each of those constraints, we had sensitivities and specificities. Uh, and so what this showed is that in general, the sensitivities and specificities uh, range from about, uh, from about 71% uh, up to 100%. It's a reasonable diagnostic performance, but definitely not perfect. And uh, we can talk more about that in the, in the panel. Uh, but as the babies get older, uh, the diagnostic performance gets much better. And so this is the 35 to 37 week point. point. Uh, uh, the sensitivities and specificities in general range from 91% uh, up to 100%. And then the thing that I especially want to highlight from this is that for these clinically significant cutoffs, uh, was there type 2 or worse, or was there treatment requiring disease, uh, the sensitivity was 100% okay, for all three graders. In other words, there were no cases of truly clinically significant disease, according to the ophthalmoscopy as the reference standard, uh, that were missed by telemedicine. And I think that that's, that's important to point out. Okay, so it seems to, it seems to work. And um, uh, when you look at the literature, uh, we count over 20 studies of accuracy, uh, all with a fairly similar design. And uh, uh, Mike Tracy led a group that was called Photo Rock, and I'll, I'll let him talk about that. Um, but for some of the other ones to point out, um, and we've got the first author of the study, how many babies, how many uh, exams, uh, what the cutoff was for diagnosis. In other words, were they trying to diagnose presence or absence of plus disease, or were they trying to diagnose, for example, presence or absence of referral warranted ROP, basically type two or worse. And uh, here's the sensitivity and the specificity. And uh, a couple things to highlight here are that uh, the first study that we found uh, was uh, a Schwartz et al., uh, Steve Schwartz, and uh, 19 babies, 100% uh, sensitivity for diagnosing plus disease. Uh, the largest study uh, that we found was a, a Birgit Lawrence's study, which I'll really talk about in more detail, but you know, actually amazing work, you know, over 6,000 eye exams. And their cutoff was something called uh, a suspected treatment requiring ROP, and the sense of which 100%. Uh, and the most recent one that we found uh, uh, was Sean Dye in Australia, uh, 400 uh, 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 exams, and the cutoff was presence or absence of treatment requiring ROP, basically type 1 ROP or worse, and they had 100% sensitivity and 98% uh, specificity. Uh, so I think that there's a fairly strong literature base that uh, this can uh, work, but the question, one thing about all of these studies is that they assume that the ophthalmoscopic exam gives you the correct diagnosis. And um, but the question, one question that we became interested in is, well, what is really the correct diagnosis? In other words, uh, how do we know that ophthalmoscopy is inherently better than a review of a photograph of the eye? And uh, this is not an easy question to really study uh, systematically. And the way that we chose to look at it uh, was by asking the question, uh, how well does telemedicine agree with ophthalmoscopy? And um, the reason that we looked at it this way is that, uh, uh, you know, I think that there's, uh, uh, there's often a lot of practice variation among physicians. Uh, it's been pretty well documented across all medical fields that when different doctors are shown even the exact same data, uh, they often come up with different diagnosis and management plans. And that makes this a really tough question to study. And the way that we uh, chose to do it uh, was by looking at intra-physician agreement uh, between telemedicine and ophthalmoscopy. And the rationale for that is that we felt that it may neutralize for that confounding factor of having different people involved and let us focus on the diagnostic differences that are due solely to the modality, whether you're using telemedicine or ophthalmoscopy, to come up with your diagnosis. And so um, the way that we specifically uh, set about doing this is that in the data set that we talked about before, all the babies had an eye exam that was done by a pediatric ophthalmologist. We then had those same pediatric ophthalmologists go back and use our telemedicine system and perform image-based telemedicine exams on the babies who they examined originally. And so just to try to uh, diminish any likelihood that the ophthalmologist remembered anything about specific retinas, uh, number one, our system didn't have any patient identifiers, obviously. And number two, we had them do it six to 12 months later. And so it was a built-in washout period. Um, and when you have the exams categorized based on no disease, mild, uh, type two or worse, and treatment requiring disease, um, the absolute agreement between telemedicine and ophthalmoscopy 